This case takes place in Lancaster, Massachusetts on the 23rd of August 2003. John Jogan was born in 1935 in Boston. When he was only five years old, his father passed away. His father's death is said to have had a profound effect on his life. Due to his family telling him that his father was now in heaven, John became fascinated with religion from that age onwards. He pursued priesthood after graduating from the Holy Cross College in 1957. By 1962, John was ordained and was assigned as an assistant pastor at the Blessed Sacrament Parish. It was here that John began his disgusting crimes. After a few years working at this parish, a reverend came forward and claimed that he had seen John bringing young boys into his room. However, this reverend who had caught John was threatened and told that he would be punished if he spoke out. In 1968, a man claimed to have caught John touching his son inappropriately. This allegation was brought before the church officials and as a result of this horrific allegation, John was sent to the Seton Institute, a psychiatric facility in Baltimore, Maryland. There he was treated and subsequently released. The church welcomed him back. In 1974, John was yet again accused. He became close with a woman who had four sons named Joanne McLean. One day, Joanne's youngest son told her that John had essayed him and his three older brothers. All three of the older brothers confirmed this to be true. Joanne complained to the higher-ups of the church, although upon discussing the crimes in a meeting, she was told to keep it a secret. John was then moved to another parish. That very same year, he was accused again of inappropriately touching a young boy. Bishop Thomas Daly had been tasked with investigating the crimes of John, although after a very brief investigation, he found John to be innocent. Shortly after reaching this decision, John spoke with a reverend and confessed to essaying seven young boys. Following this admission, John was sent by Bishop Daly to undergo further psychiatric treatment. After his treatment in 1981, John was moved to the St. Brandon's Parish in Dorchester. From 1981 to 1984, John was accused of further crimes involving vulnerable children. In 1984, he was moved to the St. Paula's Parish in Weston. Here, John was put in charge of three youth groups. Many in the church knew of the long list of crimes involving minors, and they spoke up. A number of complaints were made to the Archbishop Bernard F. Law. These complaints were read and acknowledged. However, despite this, those who complained were assured that John had, quote, fully recovered. This, of course, was not the case. He was again accused of further crimes in 1986. He was sent away again for treatment and was forced to leave the ministry in 1989. He tried to rejoin, but further accusations in 1991 put a stop to this. In 1993, after 28 years as a priest, John retired and moved into a residence for retired priests. In 1996, even more allegations surfaced. From 1996 to the year 2000, 70, that is 70, accused John of S.A. As a result of these allegations, John was defrocked in 1998. In 2001, a total of 150 cases of SA were brought against John, a number that is just beyond sickening. He was charged in 2001 and pleaded not guilty. John was found guilty in 2002 for essaying a boy in 1991. He was given the maximum sentence of 10 years in prison with the Boston Archdiocese agreeing to give 86 of the victims a $30 million settlement, although only $10 million was paid following the negotiations. Although, as you can imagine, many in the prison didn't take too kindly to someone that had committed such crimes, especially someone that was so prolific. Prisoners would often taunt and beat up John. The guards not only didn't stop this, sometimes they would join in. John was then moved to a higher security prison in Lancaster, Massachusetts. 
although inside this prison was a man named Joseph L. Drews. Joseph was in this prison for killing a man in 1988. I shall quickly delve into Joseph's life. He was born in April of 1965, and from around five years of age, Joseph had been having psychological issues. He was known to bash his head against rocks and walls, and was medicated in his teenage years. By his mid-teens, he was an addict, and after leaving high school, he committed a string of offences such as theft, dealing illegal substances, and forgery. When Joseph was 23 in 1988, he and a friend were hitchhiking when a 51-year-old man named George Rollo picked them up. Joseph would later claim that George drove them to an isolated area and began to touch his groin. After trying to make an advance, Joseph began to viciously beat George. Joseph and his friend then tied up George and placed him in the boot and began driving his car. The two men pulled into a car park. Joseph got out and strangled George in the boot of the car with a rope and ended his life. Joseph was arrested for the crime. When he was evaluated by a mental health professional, it became apparent that he had a number of issues. Joseph would lash out and become enraged for little to no reason. He would laugh as he described how he would take his own life. Joseph would claim that when he was younger, he was frequently beaten by his father. And tragically, at the age of eight, he was essayed by three men. One of them was a church official. Joseph was also a self-proclaimed neo-Nazi and had a strong dislike towards Jews, African Americans and gay people. He was found guilty of first degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Whilst in prison, Joseph sent over 30 fake anthrax letters to lawyers with Jewish sounding names and often spoke about how he wanted to kill his entire family. Anyway, John and Joseph were in the same prison and in the same section of this prison. And Joseph had a particular dislike towards people who have committed the kinds of crimes that John was found guilty of. Whilst in prison, Joseph claimed that he overheard John having a conversation with his sister on the telephone. In these conversations, John was talking about his plans upon his release. When he got out, his goal was to move to South America so he would be able to work with children again. Joseph also claimed to have heard him bragging about his crimes to other prisoners. Upon hearing this, Joseph confronted him and said, You have destroyed the lives of 150 children. To which John responded, I'm worth 300 of them. Joseph would confront him again and was met with a similar arrogant response. These responses filled Joseph with rage. So, on the 23rd of August 2003, Joseph was able to gain access to John's cell. Lunch had just ended and the prisoners were made to return their trays. It was at this point that Joseph ran into his cell and was able to jam the electric door to John's cell with some nail clippers and a book. In a calm voice, Joseph told John that he needed to hold him hostage so he would be able to get transferred to a different prison. John agreed, but he didn't have much choice in the matter anyway. Joseph used a t-shirt to tie up John's hands behind his back. He then threw him to the floor. Joseph used a pillowcase to strangle John. He strangled him with such force that John turned purple. As John began to lose consciousness, he released him. Joseph then got onto the bed and repeatedly jumped on John's body as he lay on the ground, stomping on him as hard as he possibly could. An officer on duty heard noises coming from John's cell, but he could not open the cell door. It took a number of them to pry open the door. The video of them trying to open the door is actually on YouTube. When the guards were able to get inside, they could tell that John was not going to survive the attack. He was pronounced dead nearly an hour later, aged 68. Joseph was charged with murder. During the trial, Joseph tried to plead insanity, however this was rejected by the jury. 
he gave his reasons for killing John, speaking about the SA he suffered as a child himself, and also claiming that he had heard John bragging about his crimes, and his desire to work with miners again upon his release. Joseph stated that letting him live was something that he just couldn't do. Joseph also stated that he wanted the innocent children to be avenged, and said, I see myself as the designated individual who had to put a stop to the predators in the church. The prosecution, however, told the jurors that Joseph was a convincing killer who planned the murder for weeks so he could be seen as a big shot in prison, and stated, Joseph is not a mentally ill person just raging out of control. He's a calculating individual who waited for his opportunity. Joseph was found guilty of first-degree murder and was given another life sentence. A few theories have been thrown around about the death of John. Some believe that Joseph was paid to kill him, and some believe that the prison guards were in on it too, as it was found later that there was knowledge that Joseph was planning to do something. As for the whole Catholic Church cover-up scandal, that's a story for another time, as it goes far far deeper. For this, I wanted to focus on John, who is, quite possibly, one of the worst humans to ever exist. His long list of crimes and the cover-up of his crimes are beyond disgusting. I do believe that he is very much deserving of being placed on this list.